I was looking at media.ccc dot de today to check out how many talks of console hacking we already had at the congress and it it's quite a long list actually so we had uh, the xbox 360 playstation 3 at 23 c3 we had playstation portable at 24 c3 we had a lot more it's a really really long list and um, i'm really excited to have ifan lu and davy here today and they're going to tell us a little bit about the hack of the PlayStation Vita. And um, yeah, let's see how they hack it. Please give a warm applause to Ivan and Davy. So thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, so I know some of you did this already, but show of hands, how many of you own a PlayStation Vita? Okay, that's a few of you. How many of you own a Nintendo 3DS? Okay, so that's the audience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm hoping by the end of this talk, I can convince you to come to the uh, better console. Um, <laughs> so who are we? Um, we are Team Molecule. This is our mascot. And um, Davey, I'm Ifan for the lawyers. I'm XYZ. And there's also Proxima, who is uh, not here today. Um, we've been hacking PlayStation Vita since the very beginning. And um, we've done a lot of stuff on it. So overview of the talk today. Um, so this is a foundational talk. So we want to focus more on the techniques that we've developed rather than just show the results. So some of the parts, you know, for those of you more experienced might find it a little bit tedious, but I'm hoping that, uh, you know, you'll like go through it and uh, learn something uh, anyways. Um, so they will be, will be uh, presenting the software side and I will come back later on and enlighten you with uh, some hardware stuff. And here's Davey. Hello. So I'm going to be talking about the software side of hacking the PlayStation Vita. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about a certain subset of the Vita, and that's the security code, pro yeah. security code processor. So first thing I need to talk about first is the software, the security architecture of the PlayStation Vita. It kind of looks like this. These are the basic privilege levels for the, the console. And uh, we've already worked on the PlayStation Vita for a long time now. It was released in 2012, so we're already up to the Trust Zone level. Uh, what's quite interesting about Trust Zone on the Vita is it's not actually trusted at all by Sony. Uh, it only works as a proxy to the security coprocessor, so we can simplify this privilege level down to this. So really what I want to talk about today is how I'm going to go about uh, breaking into the food kernel and the food loader levels. So food, I just said that, what is it? It's a security coprocessor and it's a special processor in that it's running a proprietary instruction set. We'll come back to the actual details of the hardware itself, but let's first talk about the two privilege levels I was talking about. The food kernel is the, the DRM layer of the system. It makes sure that games and uh, firmware updates are properly authenticated and no unauthorized code is run. The food loader uh, is more like the bootloader uh, and the startup sequence, and it just makes sure that the food kernel itself is valid. So if we want to break into these, we need to think of a plan on how to attack this. And uh, with a proprietary processor, we really need to start getting more information on it. So first thing we need to look at is the hardware architecture behind it. Uh, then afterwards, we're probably going to have to look at the software that's actually running on the processor. And from that, we can start of think of a plan of action to break into it. So first, I'm going to talk about the architecture of the system. This is the block diagram for the main system on chip for the Vita. This is called Kermit, uh, actually named after the frog. They Sony tend to name their uh, systems, the main processors and stuff, off of 
in this case on the Vita, they name it after the Muppets. There's also Ernie. Uh, there's no Bert, though, which is disappointing. Uh, on the PSP, for example, they had uh, Kirk and Spock and Pommel. So only those two on this. And we don't really care about the rest here, the CPU, the GPU. We really want to focus on food. And you can see inside food, there's the MEP C5 processor. Uh, MEP is actually a custom risk from Toshiba. And I'll talk a bit about the name food. We actually got that from the ELF headers of uh, uh, executables built for the MEP platform. You see, the ELF identifier is F00D. So we just ran with that, named it food, and it's been history since. Uh, the MET processors are normally used in parking assist cameras or uh, security solutions, but in this case, they, Sony have decided to use it for the security coprocessor. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff belonging to food, such as the crypto engine and the key slots. Uh, not very important for this talk, but the, it also has its own private memory, the secure SRAM here. Only 128 kilobytes, but uh, it cannot be accessed from ARM or, in fact, any other subsystem in the system. So with a custom risk here, uh, how do we find out information about it? Well, it's pretty much the same as anything else. You Google it. And what that turns up is a bunch of data sheets. Some are in uh, English. Most are in Japanese. So Google Translate's your best friend there. Uh, yeah. So. Following that, a couple of Google searches gives you the, the day sheets. So from there, we can learn about the instruction set. We can learn about some of the quirks. And thankfully, Red Hat have already ported the MEP platform to GCC and Binutils. So straight off the bat, we've got a compiler. We've got tools to analyze ELF files. Perfect. But really, we, we want to learn more. And the best way to learn, for us at least, is to get a little hands on. So We've built an IDA plugin for it. We've built an emulator, which was really useful because it helped us learn some of the weird quirks behind it. And we even have a decompiler, decompiler for this. So overall, what we've learned about the hardware is that the instruction set is heavily inspired by MIPS. It doesn't have any of the weird uh, like delay slot or anything like that. But the actual instruction format is pretty much the same. There's no virtual memory. And there's no memory protection whatsoever. So it, it runs purely on physical memory. It, it's not hardened for security. So this is very interesting. There's no ASLR. There's no, no execute bits. Uh, odd choice for a secure coprocessor. We thought that it wasn't very secure. So whatever. Next thing we're going to talk about is the actual software running on food. And at runtime on the PlayStation Vita, there's this secure kernel that's running at all times. And the main purpose of that is to load uh, applets, which are executables that encapsulate some sort of functionality on the system. Examples of this are encryption, signature checks, uh, DRM, and whatever you want to use, like some of feature that needs to be authenticated. What, what you do is you load it. Uh, and once you load it, you can then do some sort of RPC calls to then do some calculations or decryption or authentication or whatever. Uh, and then afterwards, you unload it. Because this, the applets follow a life cycle where you, you load an applet, you do your stuff, you unload it, and only a single applet can be loaded at once. And unfortunately for us, uh, the applets are signed and encrypted. So we can't just create our own one, load it, and then have access to the food. So let's look at the life cycle in a bit more detail. Specifically, we'll start with applet loading. Uh, so you see here, there's three regions here. You see ARM, Trust Zone, and Food. As I mentioned, uh, Trust Zone is mostly useless. It only works as a proxy between ARM and Food. So we can simplify this model down. And we can start talking about how uh, the, the applet loading works between ARM and Food. So ARM will start off. It will read the applet into memory. It will then transfer that applet over to food. Then in food, it will then check the signature of it, make sure it's a valid applet. And then it will start decrypting and loading it. 
once done, it will return the result, whether that was successful, it failed, or something else. For Applet RPC, it's, it's mostly the same pattern here. It formats a request, sends that over to the food secure kernel. The secure kernel will then forward that to the applet. Uh, then the applet will run whatever commands needed, and the result will be sent back to ARM. Unloading, pretty much the same thing as you'd expect. What happens is uh, the request is unloaded. You, you request an unload, food will oblige, and you'll get the result back, whether that was successful. So knowing this, uh, we need to start thinking, how can we actually go about attacking this? So let's summarize what we know first. We can control all the input into food. And importantly, none of this input is checked at all. Uh, Trust zone doesn't do it. So we can pass in as much or as little malicious data as we want. Uh, we know the memory layer of food. This is mostly inferred from the data sheets we got. But also, interestingly, the applets have an ELF header, and they have uh, segment headers in there which say which address it looks to. So we can, we can build a pretty good model of what the internal memory looks like. Uh, the security code processor has no security features whatsoever, so that's really handy. Uh, we, we know what the applet lifecycle is. We know that they're loaded. We know we can then do some RPC calls. Uh, and then we can then query those RPC calls for any sort of issues. What we need to watch out for is there's a signed executable, so we can't modify any of these executables. Otherwise, we'll get thrown back with an error. We can't, uh, we can't uh, read these executables. They're all encrypted, so we can't do any analysis of them beforehand. And this basically makes the system a black box here. So ideally, what we're after in order to proceed any further is some sort of read primitive that will allow us to go ahead, inspect the food private memory, and then from there, we can start looking at the code, and we could establish a more uh, precise attack on it. So I'm going to go back to applet loading here, and we're going to try and discuss in detail what's happening. It's because specifically, uh, we know that the applet's read into memory, and it's transferred over to food, where it does a signature check, and then does the rest of the loading. But what happens for this little bit in between here? And there's two problems here. Uh, first one is that ARM operates with virtual memory, and food does not. So uh, this, has, this is a problem because virtual memory is not guaranteed T to be backed by contiguous physical memory. So whenever we want to send data to food, we're going to have to make sure that uh, it's either copied to that or that the memory that we don't use virtual memory, which is kind of ridiculous. So there, there needs to be a better way. And, and Sony have a better way of doing this. And we'll come to that shortly. Uh, so this is virtual memory, and this is physical memory. You could see that we have page one through to page seven. And if you look at the physical memory side, you could see that the pages aren't in order. So if we were to pass page one's physical address to food, it won't receive the right uh, data. It will receive page one, some unknown data, page four, page three, not intended. What Sony do here is they add a physical address list, this p adder list. Instead of passing the data, all it does is you pass the p adder list to food, and it will query, uh, it will query the list, which has the first element is the location of the page that we want. So you can see the first element here points to page one. Uh, the second element in that list is the size. So what food will do when it wants to read an executable is it will walk this list and build the model up from inside. And this is the way they can get around having to copy uh, virtual memory to a contiguous block. So applying this to food and to the applet specifically, the food module is an applet. Uh, what you can see here is that the first three bytes of this food module is represented by the first entry of the p-adder list. The second the, is the second in the p-adder list, and so forth. And you can see that all these data is backed in DRAM. This solution fixes the copying, and then we've learned how data is passed to food. And this is uh, consistent throughout uh, transfers to food. Uh, there's a problem, though. If we go back to this model here, and we can see that all the data is backed in DRAM, what happens if we modify one of these p adder list entries to then point to the food private memory? Well, 
as it turns out, FID does not blacklist its own private memory. Uh, useful, maybe. Uh, not here, because uh, the internal memory, uh, FID keeps all its data internal, so it doesn't copy anything out with this header, so no leak, but uh, uh, data is also signature checked. The applet is also going to be checked, so this makes it useless, right? Because we're passing in uh, to unknown data, it's doing a signature check, it's obviously just going to fail. Or is it? Because if we make an assumption, right? If the data we're pointing to in SRAM matches the expected data that we have in the applet, we'd expect the signature check to succeed. And then we can make a deduction here that if that signature check succeeds, we know the contents of the SRAM. So let's do this a bit better here. If we reduce the PADR list entry pointing into the private memory to one byte and then simplify the PADR list with the module, to look more like this, where you have the first entry that is uh, the first part of the file. The one element for the, this point in the food private memory is the 0, 0 byte. So we're interested in finding in food private memory where all the 0, 0 bytes are. So every time we pass in uh, this PADR list, what we would expect is whenever there's a 0, 0 point to in this element here that's in SRAM, that the signature check would succeed. So if we start by going through this, so we have the element pointing at the first byte in the private memory. And we can then pass it into food. It fails. The signature check fails. So what we've learned here is that that byte in memory is not 0, 0. We can go on. We can go to the next byte and query that. Also not 0. And we could do this so on and so on and so on until eventually we should expect to see uh, a success. So the module was loaded. And what we've learned from that is that byte there is 0, 0. It matches the one in food, uh, the, the food uh, applet. So yeah, we've learned that that's 0, 0. We can then go ahead and apply this all the way through the rest of food private memory. And there we go. We've built up a model where all the zeros are. So we've learned where the zeros are. Not very useful. What we want to do now is look for the zero ones. So if we then rearrange the PADR list, so the missing byte in the food applet is 0, 1, we can then do the same thing again. We po point our entry into the food private memory to uh, the start. We start querying. Eventually, hope we find another 1. Keep going. Keep going. We don't need to query the zeros. We already know they're there. Then we get here again, and we find another 1. Then you could do the same thing again, apply all the way down to the end of memory, and you find all the ones. So imagine we've built this model. So what we want to do now is then apply it to all the 02s, then all the 03s, and all the 04s, and all the 05s, all the way up to the FFs. And once you've done that, you build a model of the food uh, SRAM, and you get the plain text to the kernel. This is what we're calling the octopus exploit. Uh, don't ask why. Uh, so with this, we now have the food kernel. We, we got read access. We can then do some further analysis. We can start looking for more precise vulnerabilities. We, we won't go into that, but we've got the food kernel. So what's next? It's the, the food loader. And the food loader is the boot stage, and because it's the boot stage, uh, it, it doesn't last very long. It doesn't persist through runtime. And that makes the software attack surface very small. So to deal with that, what we're going to have to do is look at hardware. And I'm going to pass you back to Ifan, and thank you very much. Thank you, Told you I would be back. Um, so, you know, we ran into the situation where the, you know, weak little software hackers have to be rescued by the hardware master race. Um, so, 
what I'm going to focus on today is glitching. And I know, you know, that word is kind of a buzzword these days. Many of you have heard it. I think even at Congress, there were a couple of talks on it. But uh, instead of just saying, hey, we glitched it, uh, I want to kind of go into the details of, you know, what is glitching, how does it work, and why does it work? So in short, a, a, a hardware glitch allows you to create a software vulnerability when none exists. And there's many ways of doing so, but we're really going to focus on one of these uh, methods today, which is voltage glitching. And the reason is because the other ways are much more difficult and expensive to pull off, and some of them are only theoretical. So uh, to show a concrete example, I have um, a bit of C code. Um, so this code you know, just does a size check, and then uh, the processes data if the check passes. And I went ahead and compiled it into MIPAssembly. So um, if you haven't seen MIPAssembly before, and why would you? Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, and then you know, I will just execute it for you as the computer. So uh, you know, here we load the size value. And then SLTU3 um, basically is uh, less than unsigned. And it sets R0 to the result of that. So here it's set to 0 because uh, it uh, was not less than. And because of that, uh, we jump to the error branch. And there's, you know, it's fully secure. There's no way of hacking it. Uh, just give up. But if we introduce a voltage glitch at this point, uh, what we do, what, what happens is that this will um, create a uh, mistake in the computation. So as you can see here, R0 is supposed to be set to 0, but because of the voltage glitch, um, it's now 1, which propagates the next instruction when we're taking a branch base off of that result, and we manage to bypass this check. Why does it work, though? Uh, this is something that's near and dear to my heart because uh, I'm the kind of person who, you know, uh, you can tell me the high-level ideas, but I'm not really satisfied until I know the low-level details. So to explain that, we unfortunately have to look at transistors and logic gates. Um, so if you don't remember this, don't worry, I'll, I'll explain it as well. Um, so this is uh, NAND, uh, or not not AND, um, and here's a truth table. And we are going to implement this in modern transistor technologies, or uh, CMOS. Um, it's a complementary transistor technology. What that means is there's two different types of transistors that implements the gate. Uh, one is, uh, as you see on top, um, is uh, used on the, I guess, the top part of the diagram. I'll, I'll show you the diagram later. It'll make more sense. But basically, this acts as a switch. The gate um, activates, and then the current will flow from the source to the drain. Um, so kind of like a light switch, but uh, instead of you know using your fingers, it's controlled by the voltage at the gate. The only difference between these two is that the voltage to turn on the top gate is low. So when there's no voltage, the top gate turns on. And on the bottom one, it turns on when it's high. So when there is voltage, it, it turns on. And that's what makes them complementary, because one must always be on when the other one's off. So here's what the NAND gate looks like. Um, so you see the bottom gates are off. The top gates are on because uh, 0 NAND 0 is 1. And you see current flowing from the source to the output. Now, 1 NAND 0 is still 1. And the way that works is that one of the top gates is turned off, but the other one is still on. So it's still flowing through. The bottom one, one of them is turned on, but that doesn't matter because the second one is turned off. So the, you know, it doesn't leak down to the uh, bottom port. Now, 1 NAND 1 is 0, and you can see it's because the two are turned off. Now, why are the bottom two turned on? Because, you know, like, a, uh, like when you turn off a faucet, um, sometimes there's water that drips down, right? So you need something to collect that. So what happens when we glitch it, right? Um, so here's, you know, back to the 1 NAND 0 example. When we say we introduce a glitch, what we, or a voltage glitch, what we do is we essentially connect the voltage source down to ground or uh, zero volts. Um, essentially, you're, you know, you're 
you're disabling the power source. And immediately, that doesn't do anything. So you can see here, there's still a little bit of leakage current um, flowing to the output. And that's because, you know, uh, like I said, you know, it's like a faucet, right? You turn it off, and it doesn't immediately all get drained. So it's still flowing a little bit. But like a tiny moment later, then the output goes to zero. And that is incorrect, right? Because one nan zero should be one. However, here's the important part, right? You have to then turn it back on and restore the value. Otherwise, if you keep it off, then all the transistors in the system are going to turn off, and your system just powers down, and you can't do anything useful. So the key here is that um, we have you know, an incorrect output, but only for a small amount of time, because we have to turn it. We, we can't get away with leaving it off. And because if we you know, leave it off for too long, then it uh, turns off. But not all hope is lost, because that mistake for that tiny amount of time will actually propagate if, uh, if it's done at the right place. So here's you know, like a tree built from multiple NAND gates. And you know, let's say the, the voltage glitch caused this output to be incorrect. But that's an input for these two gates, right? which is an input for these two. And these two are inputs for that one. So you effectively you know, created mistakes in about half the circuit. But that's the ideal case. In reality, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to determine like, how the error is going to propagate. Because if you think about the truth table for NAND logic, it's, there's only one way of getting um, a, a one way of getting a one and three ways of getting a zero, or the other way around. Uh, <laughs> but my point is that uh, you know, it's not even even to get the right output that you want. The, you know, the, the upshot, though, is that we can cause um, an incorrect output uh, for a short amount of time. We have to wait for it to propagate. And um, like I explained before, because the, like, you know, these logic gates aren't uh, completely symmetric, it's easier to reach one state than the other. The system can correct itself. And this is actually by uh, digital system design. One of the reasons why your computer is so robust is because it can correct mistakes like this. Um, like we are injecting a voltage glitch uh, manually, but uh, glitches are a known thing in digital logic, and it, a lot of times it happens without any external sources. So circuits are designed to correct itself, which is why we need to find specific targets with uh, voltage glitch to actually get them to uh, really do what we want. Um, and the ideal case is that you know, one error propagates through much of the circuitry. And example, examples of that includes you know, arithmetic instructions, AES hardware, like you know, branching, like in processors. Anything where you can imagine like changing the input a little bit will create a lot of you know, gears turning metaphorically um, and uh, result in like, a widely different output. So that's a theory. You guys can wake up now. Um, we're going to get to the actual practical part, which uh, includes you know, finding out where to attack, what to attack, and a little bit on automation. And that will make more sense uh, when we get to it. So what do I mean by uh, where to attack? Um, so this here is an image of the PCB, uh, where the Vita's main system chip Kermit is laid on top of. And um, with anything as complicated as this, there's dozens of different voltage rails that power different parts of the chip, including like DRAM and I.O. pads and so on. But we only care about the the power pins that go directly to the transistors. So we need to find which pin that corresponds to. To make things worse, uh, each power rail, voltage rail, is actually connected to dozens of pins. So it's not just like one pin corresponding to uh, one thing. And there's you know, 724 pins. But um, I can show you a way that we can uh, go through this um, like manually. It's not easy, per se, but it's doable. Um, and it's 
doable uh, over a weekend or two. Um, and it's, it's a process that involves mapping out the pins on, on a PCB. And um, so to back up, of course, we don't have a data sheet. Um, I think it's a lot easier if you have like a commodity chip uh, where you can just look up the data sheet and see like where each pin corresponds to. But if you have a system with a completely custom designed chip, uh, you won't have that resource. Um, so one thing that you have to do, though, is uh, what's called PCB delayering. And I think um, there's been talks about in the past, um, which I think uh, I recommend you guys look up. Um, but the, the, the takeaway is that it's relatively inexpensive and anyone can do in their own home uh, with the right tool. Uh, fortunately, um, someone by the name of Byteful uh, uploaded full PCB scans of the Vita's um, board. And that's fortunate for me because I don't have to breathe the fiberglass particles when you uh, start removing the solder mask. So with the solder mask gone, um, you, you see the uh, copper layer corresponding to the, the different pins here. And uh, one thing I want to point out here is you can see that some of the pins look like pins and other ones look like, you know, like they're part of a, a sausage or uh, what do you guys call it here? Um, anyways, uh, the, the ones near the center is more likely to be power related because if you think about like designing a chip, right? Like you want to put your uh, power sources near the center so they can dissipate evenly and um, and it's the distance to each component should be uh, relatively close. So um, what we want to do is we want to take like one random pin and we want to see where it is connected, like where, what power source is connected to and what other pins is associated with it. And to do that, uh, we just, uh, you know, we mark the pin. So the convention I'm going to be using is I will be marking one layer in red, and then I will go down another layer, and then I will use orange to show a new marking on that layer. So here, you see a, a bunch of these uh, small, dark, Hose. These are called vias. They're used to connect the metal layers, the two metal layers together. So when you have a via, that means there's an electrical connection from one layer to the other in, for that specific uh, copper pad. So we go down one more and you see uh, you know, the vias on this layer are a bit bigger than the last one. And then we can just keep going down until eventually we reach um, a copper plane that this via is connected to. And I'll uh, put an outline around it so uh, it's more clear. So this is where the source um, for that power pin um, comes from. And I'm not going to show you uh, like the actual, I guess, the actual power the chip that powers that plane um, because it's off this image. What's important here is that there's many of these other uh, vias on this plane that um, I've highlighted in red. So all of these are connected together on this layer. Now we can work backwards and do the same thing and basically find you know, where it's connected each time and highlight the copper that's associated with. And then we get to the top and we see that all of these little sausages are connected together. And this, these are 35 pins that are, corresponds to one voltage rail. And that means we only have 689 more to go. <laughs> but uh, the good news, 245 of them are not connected. And you can just see that by looking at like layer one to layer two. There's like no connections. Um, 175 of them are ground, which means uh, on the first or second layer, you can just easily see they connect to the large copper pad that like most other things are connected to. With, so really, there's only 269 pins left. Um, it's, it's, it's not you know, the, the best thing to be doing on a Friday afternoon, but you know, if you're me, what else do you have, right? Um, so this is what the chip looks like, uh, fully mapped out. The, the red ones are the different voltage rails. Um, the different shades uh, corresponds to the different voltage rails. 
Um, and the other colors uh, are data pins that are not really relevant here. Um, I just did it for extra credit. So we found nine different voltage rails. How do we know which one's the right one? And to, do, to find out, we just uh, basically try each one. Um, you know, brute forcing nine things isn't that bad. Uh, we write a counter that increments like five different registers, and then uh, we just you know hook it up to the computer, and we just try voltage glitching each one until we see uh, one of these counters change. So why why does that work? Well, remember um, when we create a voltage glitch, uh, it it effectively you know, creates a mistake in some computation. So here, because, like, the most, because of the, how tight that loop is, most of the work the processor is doing is going to be increment, or incrementing or decrementing these counters. And um, when, you know, when the glitch hits, it, it will probably like, hit one of the uh, ALU operations, which will cause a mistake like this. So, you know, we have this tool, this tool that we found, which is uh, a, a voltage glitch. We found the right power rail. Um, we can arbitrarily uh, create mistakes in the computation, but what can we do with it? Uh, so from, you know, previous talks and from uh, other resources, the clear uh, way to go is to bypass signature checks. However, um, on the Vita, that's a bit hard for us to do, and um, some of the reasons include we don't really have examples of what, what the bootloaders look like decrypted, so we don't really even know where the signature is, and we don't know if there's like other kinds of checks, like, uh, any, like SHA hashing or anything like that. So it, it was, it's just hard for us to tell if our glitch worked and it bypassed the signature, but something else failed, or if the glitch didn't work. Instead, um, we, we looked at something that's, that's easier to understand, which is the boot partition headers. And the, the boot partition uh, contains the bootloaders. It's a special partition format that's uh, not standard. However, it is easy to understand. It's unencrypted, it's unsigned, um, and the fields you know, you are not that many, and you can kind of guess what they mean. We'll just focus on looking at the header size field because, spoilers, it worked. Um, and the size field is checked to be less than 0x DE blocks. We found this out uh, through basically uh, trial and error. So we tried writing you know, 0x FF and it didn't boot up. Then we tried writing you know, 0x40, and it worked. Then we tried writing you know, 0x E0, and it didn't work. And then through this like, kind of uh, like manual binary search kind of thing, um, we found that this was the largest value uh, before it doesn't boot up. Um, if, you know, if the check fails, it halts. And if it passes, then uh, we can see that the, the, the actual bootloaders are read from the storage. So what happens if we manage to bypass the size check? Well, the theory is that um, it will overflow some buffer because, you know, why, will you, why do you check the size if you don't have a static buffer, right? Um, so the plan is we need to uh, sniff the, the storage controller traffic, um, and that's you know, just some external pins. Um, we have a MOSFET, which is basically just an electrically controlled switch that will uh, do the shorting that uh, we discussed earlier. And uh, for, we need a FPGA to control that MOSFET because uh, we need very precise like nanosecond level uh, timing. And um, the reason why is because, uh, so this is you know, the, the process to, to find the, the right parameters to glitch with. Um, the, the important thing here is you know, we wait until that boot partition header is read, and we know that at some time, some short amount of time after the header is read, it will do that size check, but we don't know when that is. So that's what parameter n represents, is the 
the offset from reading the packet to when the size check is done. Then uh, we do the glitch and we you know, hold the power off. We, we short it for a M amount of time. And basically, uh, the reason why we vary M is because, uh, remember, when, when we're glitching, we don't really know what results we're causing. So the longer you hold a glitch, the, the, the results vary wildly. And if you hold it for too long, then the, the system shuts down. So we basically you know, just have a script that looks at every possible N and M value and you know, try different ones. So how do we actually implement this? Um, so I use the Chip Whisperer, uh, which is a uh, open source hardware hacking platform. And uh, one of the reasons why it's so nice is because you can use Python to script all that uh, process that I talked about earlier. It has an FPGA um, and a MOSFET, which is the only thing you really need. Um, and we added a custom trigger for monitoring the uh, storage traffic. Also, we, had a, we designed a custom board. Um, and the, the only reason why is really to manage all the wires because you know, we, we, there's all the wires to the, the different pins for the storage controller. And then there's a couple of GPIOs for like status indicator and stuff. So it's easier to just put them all on a board. And uh, we also uh, use this board to dump and flash the storage to you know, uh, put our payload on and it connects directly to the chip whisperer. Here's what it looks like hooked up. Um, I made very liberal use of uh, transparent tape. And I, one thing I want to point out here uh, that I haven't mentioned before is that we actually connected, we removed the, the clock of, this, of the Vita, and we connected it directly to the chip whisperer. And the reason why is that uh, we found that if you synchronize the two clocks, the device's clock and the chip whisperer's clock, then when we are searching for those M and N parameters, uh, the, there's less drift, and it makes um, the results more repeatable. So, the, the so this is what it looks up hooked up. Um, once again, I love tape. Um, and so the, the, final, the final piece that, put, that we had to put together um, was actually uh, help from someone in the X switch hacking community who uh, told us to slow down the clock even more than what we already did. And it turns out, um, you know, if you're running the clock too fast, it uh, creates too much noise and that could disturb the glitching process. So, um, you know, take away, if it's not working, try slowing down the clock. So ran this all night and woke up the next morning, looked at the logs, and we found a vulnerability. And this is the boot ROM SHA-256 hash. So, State of the Vita in 2018, we managed to dump every part of it. Uh, the boot ROM, unfortunately, is not too interesting. They don't have any keys in it. Um, they don't have uh, anything that's, they, the attack surface is just so tiny. They don't have like a USB stack in it because that's crazy, right? Um, and, you know, uh, we managed to dump all the code we can find on the system. So what have we learned? Um, so let me get a little philosophical for a moment. Sony had a history of crypto failures. Um, I think most of you here know about all of these. But if not, you know, history lesson, PSP didn't check code signing in the beginning. Um, PS3, the infamous fail overflow, uh, ECDSA factoring. Uh, and recently we found on the PlayStation Classic, they shipped uh, the private keys for the firmware updates on every single device. 
but the Vita is actually a, a very nice, um, you know, work in terms of security. Um, unfortunately, you know, can't speak to amount of games or market share. Uh, key reasons includes the 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 boot surf the the secure boot is pretty simple. Um, all their you know cryptographic stuff is uh, relatively simple compared to uh, you know other Sony devices. Um, we didn't really touch on the ARM processor at all, the main one that your games run on, but they do implement most modern exploit mitigation. And this was back in 2012, which where you know a lot of stuff like KASLR uh, or kernel random address space randomization isn't standard. They implemented that you know way back in 2012. And they, you know, instead of trusting Trustome, they have a dedicated crypto processor. But not everyone is perfect. There is a slight issue with how they chose their bootloader description keys. And to be clear, this key protects every other key in the system. Now, after we dumped the boot ROM, Naturally, uh, the next thing we did was find this key, and it is a single byte repeating. But here's, here's a little, like, let me pull back the curtains a little. Before we dumped the boot ROM, a couple of months before, our friend XYZ, now you can decide if he has 9 IQ or 9 million IQ, XYZ decided to brute force the AES-128 key. And for legal reasons, we won't share it with you. But let's just show you an unrelated picture I found on Amazon. So um, lots of people to thank. Uh, these are just a few. Uh, I want a special shout out to Zerpi, who managed to get Linux running on the Vita last week, which was very impressive. And now um, they're trying to like, write all the drivers for it. So if any of you are interested in that and want to help, um, I can put you in touch with, with him if you uh, check us out at the um, Nintendo Bros assembly later on. Everything I talked about will be posted on GitHub. Um, if you want to know more about uh, Vita hacking and reverse engineering, uh, the Henkaku Wiki is a good resource. And if you want to write Vita Homebrew, um, the Vita SDK, which um, we helped with early on, is a good resource. Um, with that, I would like to open up the questions. Hey, great. Thanks a lot. Um, great to see how much fun you guys had hacking the thing. Uh, really cool. We have uh, five to seven minutes for Q&A, so please line up at the microphones. Um, and uh, we have some questions, probably. So, so I think microphone number five, I see somebody. Is the thing? Yeah. So the double A is the whoop key for the bootloader. Is this a joke? <laughs> Since it's totally not effective at all in my mean. So yeah, this was interesting. So at first when we found this, we thought for a long time that we we actually so we thought we accidentally had a debug build. So we thought we they accidentally shipped a debug build or something, and that's where the key was from. But turns out it's it's it is the bootloader that is used on retail devices. Um, I think the reason why it slipped like, out of checks is because they only ever use this key uh, encrypted and like, you know, it, the, 
they have a crypto processor. So in addition to food, there's a separate crypto processor that only food can communicate with, and it's the one that um, that does all the uh, encryption. So this key is never found in any like. Uh, text pages or anything or any code. It's only available in this secret hardware uh, crypto processor. Um, so maybe you know someone uh, f accidentally left the wrong key in or whatever, and nobody found out because it was hidden so well. Great. We have a question from the internet. Signal Angel, please. Thank you. Can your findings um, be reused in some ways for the PS4? Mm. Probably not. No, it's. I think the design here is mostly exclusive to the PlayStation View here. It's. I think the PS4 has some sort of uh, similar security code processor, but it's it's not the same. And also, a uh, PS4 uh, doesn't implement as many security mitigations as a Vita does. Great microphone one, please. For your work and for your talk, uh, you talked about you control the clock. From the process of the chip whisperer, did you also try to clock legit? Sorry, what was the last part? Uh, did you try to clock legit? Uh, so uh, I guess um, okay. Uh, I did. I didn't want to talk into this because it's a bit technical. But uh, clock glitching actually doesn't work on most uh, modern processors because they use something called a phase lock loop or PLL, which derives the internal clocks. And when you glitch the external clock, it will be filtered out by the PLL. So most modern devices have a PLL now, which makes clock glitching not really useful. Yes. Thanks. Microphone three, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a question is very similar, and I'm not quite sure whether my understanding of PLLs is wrong, but uh, as far as I understand, they only do clock multiplication and division. So if you change the external clock, then the internal clock, uh, clock should also change. And um, I was just curious by how much you change the clock. Right, so, the, so there's actually... Uh, it, that is true, but if you look at the like the you know the very precise like response function, the transfer function of most PLL, there is something I don't remember the technical name, but it's like a delay response. So your changes in the frequency is not instantaneous, and most PLLs are designed to not change quickly with the with the clock frequency, and it's a feature that they call uh, filtering out jitters, because sometimes your external clock can be a bit noisy, and you don't want your internal clock to follow that noise. So most PLLs are also designed specifically to not respond quickly to frequency changes um, on the outside. Thank you. We continue with microphone one, please. Uh, since the hardware and software is uh, can similar... Can you come closer to the microphone? Okay, sorry. Uh, since the hardware and software is uh, really similar, does this uh, apply to the PlayStation TV 2 or just to the PlayStation Vita? Because uh, PlayStation TV has uh, HDMI output and uh, USB input <laughs> output, so it will be, I don't know, cool just to do it on that uh, console too. So can you repeat that again? Uh, the PlayStation TV is it? Is what yeah, yeah, yeah. Really uh, yeah, it's, it's all the same, yeah. It's yeah, just the same device. Yeah, because I have both, and I just saw, like, there is the error seen sometimes uh, when you with a PlayStation TV, even if it doesn't have the same. I actually have a PlayStation TV, so if you'll come to their assembly later, we can... Uh, oh, okay, okay, I will, I will. <laughs> Great, so invitation to the assembly later. We go to microphone three, please. Hi, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, would you care to explain why it's called the octopus exploit? Uh, I'll, I'll give two quick explanations. I'll give XYZ, who found the exploit, his original explanation is that an octopus has three hearts, and uh, somehow, you know, when we have these three little, like, pieces of the uh, of the p address table one like you know one piece pointing correctly one piece pointing to the um the food private memory and one piece pointing to uh the correct data um that's like three hearts that doesn't make any sense to me 
I retconned an explanation, which is the P address list is kind of like eight octopus legs grabbing onto DRAM, which makes more sense to me. <laughs> so you see the P address list here. That's supposed to be the three hearts. Yeah. <laughs> total makes total sense, right? You can <laughs> makes total that sense. Later. <laughs> Microphone number two, please. Yeah. So my question is the initial bootloader of the food processor. Where is that actually stored? Is it like in flash or is there ROM or what is that? This is actually a very interesting question. I didn't want to get into it, but the boot ROM is never mapped anywhere in memory. So what the Vita does is on boot up, it copies the, the instructions for the initial um, you know, boot stuff from some secret hardware area that's never accessible through memory into the SRAM. And then as the boot as the boot ROM, we call it boot RAM, starts up, it like slowly wipes each part like of the key derivation and other stuff as it's executing. So yeah, it's it was kind of a pain to get. Wow, interesting. Last question, microphone number one, please. So while taking apart the hardware, did you figure out what the top right port on the original Vita is for? Is it used anywhere? Uh, so we found this out a while ago. It's actually just a USB host port, a USB EHCI port with a custom connector. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you again. Uh, great applause for Ivan Lu and Davey, please.